Hello everybody and welcome to the Monkey Business Show. Today is episode 8 and we have two very special guests. Well, Johan is here. Hi, Johan. <laughs> you're not the special guest, but you're special to me, which is the oh, important come on. part. Come on, don't take that away from me. Mom always used to call me special. Yeah, but for different reasons. <laughs> but here we have uh, two wonderful friends of ours. We have Evgeny and we have Michael. Hello, guys. How are you guys doing? Hey, guys. Hey, bro. Doing well. So I, I would like to introduce you guys a little bit and to hear a little bit who you guys are and how do you guys end up here. And especially, and the most important, why are you my friends, you know, and not Johan's friends? Evgeny, uh, so we met Evgeny a, a, few, a few months ago, maybe a, a year ago, and he's the CEO of a company called Wintermute. Evgeny, tell us a little bit more about, about you, about how do you end up connecting with us and what brought you here today? Well, that, that's, that's a long story, <laughs> almost. Well, just about myself. So, um, yeah, basically at Wintermute, we are algorithmic uh, market makers in uh, cryptocurrencies. So it might sound like very intimidating, but, and it is actually, so that's fine. Don't, you, you should feel intimidated by this, um, because it's crypto and it's algor algorithmic trading. So it's, it's quite complicated stuff. Um, and we've been in crypto for, about five years almost um and about like a year ago we started we started doing some more like i don't know retail facing experiments like we started to say okay what happens if we launch like retail facing products for example and we started to say okay we need to dip our toes and uh i don't know marketing and uh, like get, getting getting like kind of acquainted with uh this retail public in general and also looking at advertising and at the same time, I was like on and off passionate about Dota, uh, primarily from like my brother and from my uh, older son. Um, so I pretty much like go and play, I don't know, around TIs effectively, like well, once they release those. Um, uh, yeah, I, I just like really like this uh, labyrinth thing where you go and try every hero and I basically waste a lot of time on that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, uh, yeah, not, yeah. Not, not the games. The like the ones that anyway, basically, I just waste a lot of time on that. The Cameron Crawl, yeah, Crawl, the Crawl, yeah, the Cameron Crawl. I was gonna crawl. say, if he, if he only plays during TI, it sounds a lot like you, Johan. He fits already <laughs> right in, you know, G. <laughs> it's, a, it's a time to play, it's a time to play, Dolan. It's exactly it's like you can take a break of a whole year of getting it. it's okay, as long as you make it to TI, then you're fine. That's Anna, not me. <laughs> oh. But basically, like we started to look, okay, it would be super cool to actually sponsor a Dota team and it can accomplish a lot of things. And I started researching into teams because I actually was not following TIs that well. So I knew some names and then I basically asked my brother, uh, Kirill, and he was like, yeah, if you guys sponsor anyone, it should be OG. Like, there is no question about that. I'm like, okay, so tell me about them. Like, who are those guys? And he's like, well, they are OG. So. It's like the name speaks for itself almost on one hand. On the other hand, just the style that they're playing with, it's like, it's very passionate. It's very non like robotic. It's very, just, they just keep come up, coming up with new things. So they're just like a very, very unique team in that regard. And they also like on one hand, they're super good. On the other hand, they somehow always perceived as underdogs on every TI. And I kind of like that. It sounded like very much how winter mutes grew over the years as well, because we were on one hand, like really good on the other hand, we are underdogs, uh, still like there are bigger algorithmic trade companies in the world. Um, and the same time, like people know that we are good. So I felt like it was a really good match. And so we yeah, got, to, got with you guys and, uh, started discussing stuff. And I think it was just chemistry and we just decided, yeah, let's, let's just go with it. And I think we actually, uh, we actually decided to go with it even before we knew you guys, uh, made it to GI. So it was a bit of a gamble, but it also made uh, a lot of people in the office to watch, uh, like how the team was, uh, qualifying, which was very, uh, uh stressful, <laughs> uh, tell me but about I it. guess, I <laughs> guess, <laughs> no, but I mean, I guess, I guess for me, it was like the first, I, I realized what, what my brother was telling me, like, uh, when you watch OG, like you really, yeah. Like it's it you re, you really get it, and yeah, I really got it. Like it was it was really amazing seeing you guys qualify. I was gonna try to simplify a little bit of uh, what market market maker means, because I didn't know this when we started talking. 
So obviously I'm going to simplify very, very easily. So in Neiman's terms is that market making is you guys are behind all the transactions that happen inside the platforms. Like Binance is the store and these companies are the stores, but inside every single time somebody is buying or somebody is selling, I'm not making that transaction with Binance. I'm making that transaction with market makers who are buying and selling. Is that more or less what it means so people can understand it? Pretty much. So like for those, for those people who are familiar with any kinds of markets where you can buy and sell stuff, like a lot of markets, you can only buy stuff or sell stuff, but like in stocks or cryptocurrencies, you can buy and sell. So you basically see bits and offers, uh, when you log into the interface or to Robinhood or whatever, some kind of trading application. And those bits and offers are more often than not provided by market makers. So some of those bits and offers will be from retail people or maybe institutional clients, but majority of those bits and offers will be provided by market makers like us. And so when you trade on Binance or trade or trade on New York Stock Exchange, you most most often than not trade against market makers. Amazing. Thank you for the introduction. And then we have here on the other corner, Michael. I don't know if there are corners, but we have Michael. So Michael was introduced to me well we I was in Tokyo in I think it was December 2018. I was yeah, doing a documentary correct. in Tokyo about baseball. And <laughs> there was a friend that was like, you gotta meet Michael. Michael is a nerd like you, super passionate about esports. He's doing so many cool things. And yeah, I met him randomly in Tokyo uh, over dinner. And here it is. I've been bothering for three years trying to find a way to work with him. But <laughs> he continued to work on other games and on other companies. And eventually. I eventually. can never get to get him. <laughs> Michael, yeah, tell me yeah. a little bit about you. How do you start it in gaming and all that? Yeah, sure. Um, I'll try to keep it short, but let's see how, how short it gets. Uh, so yeah, so I, um, I mean, I've always played uh, competitive games uh, since I was younger. Um, actually, not so much Dota. I played like the original Warcraft Three mod, but I got into League of Legends. So don't don't kick me out. I'm I'm a League guy. Um, so yeah, I got really it's into okay. esports. We don't mind having people um, from the inferior MOBA. Yeah. And then I, uh, yeah, got, got deeper into esports, uh, worked in tech, and then eventually actually uh, started a company uh, in the esports space um, together with uh, Bitcraft, which is a, a fund in Berlin. Um, you guys might might know them. Uh, Jens Hilgers is behind them. So he, like, he and I, we talked a lot, and then basically ended up um, working on a mobile app, kind of like a fan app for esports uh, teams for their fan communities. Um, so I built. I started that company in 2016, uh, did that for two years, uh, worked together with Fnatic and G2 Esports and Immortals back then, uh, the league team, and uh, grew, with the, grew the team, raised some money. Um, was a, it was a fun ride. I was like super green as a founder with my first company, and things didn't quite work out. Um, eventually, I kind of like sold my shares to, to Bitcraft. They took it over. They kept going. Um, and yeah, and I was like more on the business side. So I studied economics and, and business and management and, and hoped I could uh, build a tech company. Uh, it was harder than I thought it was. And, um, I realized it was really not great to not know how to code. Um, so I basically took that money that I got, that little money I got left from the, from the equity that I sold, uh, and moved to Japan out of all places. Cause I was just interested in, in being in Tokyo for some time. Um, and I found like an English speaking coding bootcamp. Um, where I learned programming for like three months. Um, and this is actually how I met Dylan, so our uh, mutual friend, because he was the, the the teacher at that coding school, actually. He was my my sensei, um, teaching me programming. And um, and then we met in Tokyo. And uh, yeah, and around also in 2017, when like the whole ICO hype happened, I got really into crypto, I guess, as a lot of people. Um, and also during my company, we were looking into doing a token. I, I didn't think it would quite make sense for, for a fan app. Uh, back then we decided not to do it, but I still really liked the idea of just building, um, like building a protocol almost that is owned by the users. Um, and that kind of like having value that goes back to the users, not like a cruise on the company level. Um, so that really stuck with me. And, um, when I programmed, I played a bit with smart contracts and I really liked it. Um, so I wanted to go like kind of combine crypto and gaming. And then obviously NFTs is something that, that, you know, comes up and that was like late 2018. So it was very early. It was like deepest of the, the, the bear market. Uh, there was not much going on. Um, but basically I checked like, what are the, the top games out there? Um, and my crypto heroes was the number one game back then and happened to be built by a Japanese company. So, uh, the company is called double jump Tokyo. I reached out to them. 
they didn't really speak much Japanese, not much English, and I don't really speak much Japanese. So it was a, it was a first uh, interesting first conversation with them. Um, but they ended up hiring me, and I've been working for uh, the past three years uh, with them as an engineer, but also helped a bit on the NFT economics front of the game. So basically, I have building blockchain games or NFT games for the past three years. Um, yeah, and then we also like talked a lot about um, doing something together because I also want to like dive back to the esports world and kind of combine and see how NFTs could fit. And I see now these days more and more happening, uh, more and more esports teams getting involved in crypto and NFTs and gaming. And I think there will more. Uh, there's more to come. Um, so yeah, I'm sure we talk about this probably and in, in also later in this conversation. So want to keep a bit of room there, but that's just the the I guess longer introduction of of everything. And one thing that you forgot to mention is that you are partially behind the crypto program that G2 just launched today. It's okay. That's it's right. okay. Carlos is welcome here. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I know you guys are mutual friends. How so was that? Like, How do you end up working in this post with him? Yeah, so um, long, I mean, I guess I keep it short. Um, so Jens, so when the whole NFT stuff happened, so Jens from Bitcraft they invested in G2 uh, co-owners. And uh, he reached out to me and was like, hey, do you want to... And also, I knew Carlos still from back in the day. So they were like, exploring NFTs. Uh, they hit me up. Hey, do you want to help these guys? And, and of course, like, I mean, I, I love esports. So I want to explore what, what we could do. And back then, uh, the Bored Apes just started taking off. Um, it was just like a few days after the Bored Ape public mint. And it was like May 1st was the mint last year. Um, and then it's like around that time. And then we kind of discussed and jammed and I advised uh, the G2 team on like their internal NFT strategy, which led to the uh, project that was uh, actually the public mint went live today. So uh, on the 24th, when this is recorded. Uh, so yeah, I'm very happy that the team, uh, like they executed really well. And I think they have something really good, not, not to shill other teams uh, bags, but uh, I think, yeah, they did really well. And also Carlos is, is all super excited about uh, NFTs and, and DAOs and, and all that stuff. Awesome. Okay. So now we have pretty much the players of this conversation. We have three founders, uh, we have four CEOs, and we have four nerds that we all are very interested in crypto and very open to the idea. You know that uh, OG and crypto has already established a relationship. We have our fan token with socios and we have done three launches of NFTs. And I think that one of the conversations that we always have at the board level with Johan and Seb is what is our plan going forward? Because it's clearly an element of our story and an element of what we want to do. But every single time we say something online, I gotta say the pitch force comes out and we start getting a lot of hate. So even though I am aware that I will get hate from this podcast, <laughs> I think it's necessary that we bring people that know infinitely more than us so we can have a conversation because I get inspired every single time I talk to both of you, Evgeny and Michael. Every single time I get on the phone or we go to Lisbon together or we went to Tokyo, I'm like, okay, I want to do this. I want to do all of these things. So we're going to use this time to have a conversation about what is possible, what is not possible, what went right, what went wrong, address some of the bad actors, the good actors. And honestly, what I'm more excited about is where are we going? Where are we headed? Because this is still very early stages of what this amazing technology can allow us to do. Evgeny, you've made actually very, very public claims uh, lately that you were interested in looking into esports and gaming because you felt that there was a, an immense amount of synergy and connection between the crypto world and, and the gaming world. Tell me a little bit more about it. Uh, what was the, the information that you got or what prompted you to say those things? Yeah, so I'll start with, I'm general quite well I, I do i do play games <laughs> like occasionally a lot occasionally not a lot like depends how busy the markets are uh but i play a lot of games games not just dota i play well a lot of different ones like really popular ones like fallout for example but also a lot of indie games as well like dream world or sound sc for example like to name a few so and a lot of those games it feels like the like you look at the team and you you know it took them a lot of time to, to make it. And you know, they are not necessarily super profitable, although like there is a critical success, but they're not necessarily profitable. At the same time, if you look at like the most popular crypto games, um, they're kind of opposite. Like they're insane, they have insanely massive war chests, uh, but the games are just not there yet in terms of 
well, just being excited about it. Like, I don't know. It's like, I know some of them will get there, but I tried a few and I was just, yeah, you just not something you can spend a lot of time. It's basically, it's, it's a lot more about grind. So it's basically the whole model play to earn. It's all about grind at the moment. So it's not really about enjoying the game. It's about basically getting those like almost gaming farms in Indonesia or whatever to basically spend a lot of time grinding items, grinding potions or whatever, grinding like, well, basically money uh, for other players to maybe play it in the future. Which I think is an interesting model, and I think it will work out nicely. But like my idea was, okay, what if I approach one of those indie games that I play personally and tell them let let's let's let us help you to port you the blockchain to like do NFTs or tokens or what's not? And because like a lot of those games, you I could just see them on being on blockchain. I could see them. I can see people enjoying them right off the bat. And my kind of shock was that well half of the game didn't reply that's fine but the, the other half that did reply they say okay nfts is a scam crypto is a scam go away like we don't want to talk to you and some of them were like nice about it but it was still i could feel that yeah nfts as a scam is like a very very prevailing uh, yeah idea at least in the west like i don't know how it is in japan at the moment but yeah definitely europe america like it's it's all this, this kind of vibe and that was kind of sad because i thought okay it's, it just makes so much sense to bootstrap a lot of those indie games indie game developers that they can get just infinitely more resources they can get like a whole new audience to play those games but yes yeah, so there is just like this perception which is now really difficult to break about nft specifically is that partially is a product of just how much i don't know how much was get happening in crypto, especially over the last year in NFT space, where there was just like a lot of money grabbing projects, a lot of outright scam projects, and I think those most of, a lot of those projects they just created a bad name, and we as an industry now need to kind of find a way to solve it because it's I, I really think it's it's a really nice model to explore for like Web two. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna try to explain a little bit more. Uh, so Johan, I'm gonna try to bring you to this conversation. So what we're talking about right now is that I actually spoke with Michael about this yesterday. When we were playing World of Warcraft, you know, we used to have all these unique items. Every single time you will drop, they will become unique items. And that economy was not really built as a real economy in World of Warcraft. There was no security, there was no process, there was nothing. Anybody could try to scam you and you could not trade things safely. The way that they did is they created an auction house, which by the way, they took it out at one point because they didn't like the economy that was there. So when you were farming those things, what they're saying right now is that now we can create NFTs out of all those items. So they're kind of like safe and you have a track record and it's yours in your account and then you can do things inside the game. Yeah. That's more I, or less what they're talking. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would, I would just draw the same, same line too. I, NFTs kind of exist in different shapes. They're just not... Uh, as easily translatable, like Dota Cosmetics, a lot of them kind of function as NFTs. They've also been trying to push it where you have autographs to make them more unique, you know, in the limited edition and limited amount. Mm -hmm. And yeah, the, the way, the only way you can then translate it is if you go to Steam Market and sell it, and then you can't, you, it's only your Steam wallet that will go up. You will never be able to take that money and use it on something else if you want it. But with blockchain, blockchain technology, I mean, again, I, I don't, I don't really know yet what the main difference is between an NFT and a blockchain. For me, blockchain technology is just, and then NFTs is just like a, yeah, digital type of copy that gives you that um, feeling of uniqueness. And it's just a better technology than having just your draw ranger skin in, in Dota. You kind of have something extra that with the technology, people can't fake it. They can't fraud you or like it's all these things should be this is why it should be here is to make it uh, more uh, more power to the user more security to the user so again instead of like having it centralized in each and every game you could have you could have things that translated from game to game or like from and i guess steam steam has their own so nft thing going on with their, so the their idea is that the market correct sorry to interrupt but yeah when you have the draw ranger skin in dota that is a digital asset 
But right now you cannot sell that digital asset outside and you can actually not make money. So these earn to play games that we're Evgeny was talking is that there are games where people get in to farm items so they can sell to other people. I know I'm simplifying it a lot, but that's the idea. So the purpose of this person doesn't go in to play it, it goes in to farm it. So then he or she can sell the item to someone else for real money in the real world. And that was what Evgeny was referring. But what he's saying that is true is that those games right now are not really fun, fun, fun to play like the other ones. You're pretty much just playing it to farm to get the item to sell to someone who is really just playing it to earn and just to collect and have these big treasury things in mind, like a, like a dragon cave, you know, full of shit that you got in the game. Great, but now what do you do with that cave, you know? At one point you either have to start selling it or, or you're, there's no way to make money. So Michael, I was going to bring you this because yesterday before we started the podcast, you said exactly the same thing. That what you were looking at is what are those titles or those games that for you, the jump to mainstream is going to be like when a real game that is really fun to play and really right. huge is built on this technology. Yeah, I think to just also put this in perspective, like Axie Infinity is, is probably mm -hmm. the most famous uh, NFT game right now out there. And I think that kind of put NFT gaming on the map where a lot of game developers look at this specifically actually on the revenues. And like I need to say something here is like you can't compare Axie Infinity revenues with companies revenues. It's a completely different thing. It's like it's basically like the, the, the GDP of uh, you know the, the economy or the digital nation of Axie Infinity. It's it's different than like what value accrues at the company level, but that's a different conversation. Like what I'm what I'm gonna say is like I think we need a game um, that is also fun, but has NFTs. And as you said, like people should not join to make money. People should first join to play and have fun and enjoy the game. The making money part is like a nice bonus on top of it if you're really good as well. Not like not everybody should earn, in my opinion. Like if the lowest person earns it's not sustainable because then it opens up the the, the, the window, or like the door to like uh, bots and player farms um, and people. I mean, in Axie Infinity, for example, people are playing the game as a job. Like they're leaving their jobs to play the game. I've seen companies re like reschooling their employees playing Axie Infinity because they make more revenues um, instead of doing their old job. And I mean, I, I don't know, it's interesting that this stuff happens, but it's not really sustainable. Um, and it's kind of like Axie is not competing with like League of Legends or Dota or other like good games. They're competing with like Uber or like Gojek in these regions, right? Like with like these on-demand jobs. Um, and that, I don't know, it goes in a different direction also why like I think Axie Infinity is a very interesting case because I think it, it it's... It's the whole idea of making money in an online like digital economies and having a job online. I think in general, this is really good generally for um, like developing countries where there are limited uh, opportunities where you are physically um, and there are unlimited opportunities online. So therefore, these people go online. And I think we will live more and more online. I think there will be more value being moved uh, digitally. And these people can just find really good jobs in a digital world. And I think Axie Infinity showed us this, but I think the current model of Axie is not very sustainable. I think they have to find a way to make the game just more fun and more enjoyable. Um, and But I have the full trust in specific Axie, like in the team that they will get it right eventually. Um, but I'm worried more about other games that are like in, like inspired by Axie's success and just copy their, their ecosystem of like a governance token and then this SLP, like small love potion for like breeding and just kind of slap this onto a normal game. Um, and this is kind of what I call like so like with Web 2, you know, like the old world and Web 3 is what people now call the crypto world or like, you know, building uh, more decentralized products and protocols. Um, just slapping NFTs and tokens on top of normal games. I call this like Web 2.5 games. They're not really Web 3 games. It's just like it's a normal game and it putting NFTs on top of it. But they, they, I think they haven't fully quite understood what it means yet. And I think a true Web 3 game is more like it's designed from the ground up to... Um, have nfts in there to also make sure that if people buy into the game um they can still have an enjoyable experience because that's also one of the reasons why they took out the uh like the auction house in diablo 3 where like people they just bought in uh and got all these like items and then they didn't have fun in the game anymore because the fun of the game was like grinding right and they just skipped the grinding and they were like what's the point playing 
and then they removed like the auction house. So it's like, it was not designed for people to come in with real money and then kind of skip the whole experience and it got boring all of a sudden. Um, but I think blockchain games, they should be designed this way. Um, and I'm referring more to like poker. I think poker is a, a very interesting game where, um, yes, it's with money and it gets more interesting with money, but you also play it because it's fun, not to just make money. And it's kind of like, you know, you might lose, I don't know, 10 euros uh, playing poker in an evening, um, but that's kind of like an entertainment expense. It's kind of like buying a skin in, in League or Dota, right? It's like, it's it's okay. And I've, I mean, I'm not saying that blockchain games should be gambling or should be, you know, losing and, and making money. But what I'm saying is like, that's kind of the mental model to approach. It should be built with the monetary value in mind. And that's kind of part of the whole meta game as well. Um, and yeah, so I think we just, then the next wave of innovation will come. There's more and more gaming teams that get it. Um, it takes time um, and it will come. But I think right now we're probably more in like a, the peak of the hype cycle. Uh, people got a bit too excited. Um, it's actually really difficult to build really good blockchain games. Um, and our game, we were like number one in 2018, 19 uh, in, in Japan, My Crypto Heroes. And it, we made a few mistakes in the economy and we kind of inflated the economy and things went down. Um, so it's, it's super hard. And you also actually see like after two years or three years or four years, if the economy is actually good, like building a successful, like 10 year game, um, is super hard with a real economy. Um, so yeah, but I think, I think we see just more and more good game studios coming in and, and I'm generally very excited for the future, but we have, we have to get it right. And of course, there's a lot of also bad actors coming in, trying to extract value, um, in the space, kind of jumping on the train and. Um, it sucks because people get people get burned. They come in, they believe these people, they spend money, they lose money, and then they might not come back. Um, so I totally understand that people get frustrated, and, and gamers specifically are very, uh, yeah, worried or just generally don't like like dislike NFTs because of a lot of just bad games and shit and rock pools and scams out there. I, I get it, um, but I think there will there will be good games coming, and I think it's a very interesting um, field to experiment. Um, and I think it's also net positive for the gamer because like you can own your stuff and the value goes back to the players instead of the studio. Um, also like not, not, not to like, um, yeah, ramble too much, but basically like, for example, with the acquisition of, of Blizzard Activision, um, where they got bought for what was like $68 billion or something like the community of World of Warcraft, like the players, they received nothing from this and they made the game, uh, what it is like with with all events, uh, user generated content and cosplay and, and all that stuff, all that culture came from the people, like from the, the community and, uh, none of the value really went back to the community. It all went to the, to the company and the shareholders. And I think the idea of like web three is kind of like building things together with the community and, and give it back to them and kind of build like this digital nation, um, that Axie is, is trying to build. And I think doing pretty successfully for now, although the game is not there yet, but I think they nailed that part. So, yeah. So right. I, I, could so I ask you a question? Just, yeah, go ahead, John. Go ahead. I wanted to ask you a question. Ahead. So about the, so for me, this is also like a more profound uh, aspect of of crypto technology and and mm. generally economy and and fin like world financing. Um, I've heard a lot of people say, and it's also my belief that a more independent, more uh, sovereign economy or currency or whatever you want to say, economical economical platform is going to be better for the average worker. It's going to be better for the average person. And the same thing with what you're talking about is instead of having all the hard work and all the favors that were done, go into one pool of people who then decide exclusively how this money gets distributed back or distributed around. You're going to have more transparency and you're going to you're going to be able to have more transparency and more money staying within and kind of pay people getting yeah, value for investing their time and investing their work and effort. Uh, but how do you make sure that the people governing the the the, uh, the 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 currency, the cryptocurrency, the company, the the people with the uh, who who makes the blockchain or who makes the decision with the blockchain? How do you make sure that those people don't go ahead and become as corrupt as the next financial yeah. or old financial institution that that we've seen in the past? You know. Um, yeah, How, it's a great question. What, what are kind of ideas to stop that from happening? Is it like a voting system? Is it like some type of democracy? Is it, uh, do you, does, does it become completely uh, separate from some type of uh, company structure? I'm, I, cause I have no idea how to stop that from, yeah. from happening, like the path to corruption. 
Yeah, it's a good good question. Um, it it really comes down to the incentive structures at the end of the day. I think you have to set them properly, and what it means. So it also goes in the direction of like a DAO. So I think we could start the conversation of what a DAO is. So it stands for a decentralized uh, autonomous uh, organization. So it basically means it's basically it is a group chat with a bank account and a multi signature bank account. That's mm -hmm. what it is. So basically, um, it's a wallet that is controlled by a bunch of people that can make decisions together. And the governance usually in these games happens with the governance tokens. So in, in Axie, it's called AXS, uh, Axie shards. And um, you can like, you can vote relative to the tokens that you have and you can set up in different in different ways, you could say one token, one vote, you could say the longer you hold the token, uh, the more vote you have, um, you can also you can program all these things. So in an ideal world, and you have to remember that like building a game is like a, a gradual move towards decentralization. So you start very central with the game developer, and then you slowly open it up mm. to the community. It's kind of like an, uh, an IPO to the community, so to speak, and you give more and more tokens to them, more and more power to them. And of course, also more tools for them to govern themselves in the game. Um, and so they basically vote with the tokens and kind of say what's happening. So also where the money flows and also how much the, the developer should be paid, for example. So ideally the revenues also go to this bank account. It's called the treasury. So whenever somebody spends money in, in a game, um, it goes to the treasury. Or whenever there's a, a trade from one person to another, a part of this goes to the treasury. And that that creates just funds you can use like a country, right? You can invest this in on streets and education and health, insurance, whatever. Um, exactly. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so and, and then it's a question like, how do you govern that stuff? And um, I'm actually, so I, um, I didn't mention this before, but I joined um, a game studio a month ago. Um, they're called Mighty Bear Games based in Singapore. And we're building a, a new Web3 game uh, together. And we're thinking about um, kind of calling it like a council. So you want to have delegates that the community votes. Um, so kind of like a real uh, you know, political system where you have uh, people that vote certain other people, uh, they're called the delegates, and uh, they create the council. And you have to make sure that this council also represents different uh, parts of the community. So in, in, in this case, like the, the token holders, so the whales, we call them in crypto, um, maybe the, the PVP players are really competitive, but also maybe the, the PVE players, because they also have interests and it might be misaligned with the PVP players, right? Um, in terms of like new updates and stuff. And also maybe the free to play players, they should also have some representation because some people don't want to spend money. They don't want to invest, but you also need to represent them because they're kind of like, you know, the, the, the middle class, I guess, or lower class in an economy. And they're super important as well, because then you want them to like climb up the, the economical ladder um, and, and kind of generate value afterwards. So it's kind of, I guess to answer your question, it's super hard to do. You have to set the right incentive structures to um, create this council and make sure they're making decisions that um, benefits the long-term health of the ecosystem and the assets. Because for example, if there's only whales and they vote to give only the rewards to the whales, like the token holders, then they're free to play players, they leave. And if there's no free to play players, there's no players and this whole thing goes goes south, right? So that, just curious to hear your thoughts on this. I know this is a lot yeah, to digest, probably. I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll say, yeah. Yeah, to, to, add, to add to that, like there are, there are a bunch of other interesting dynamics as well. And like one of the dynamics is, it might not be like easily applicable to games because uh, like the code is still controlled by the core team, for example. But in general, a lot of blockchain protocols, like what they can do, and that's what happened like with a few of them, is you can literally, because most of the software is open source, you can literally copy paste the project. So if the community as a whole is not happy with direction it's going, with like current whatever voted CEO or something, or maybe somebody who's our power one way or another, like they can get together and literally copy paste the code, launch their own copy paste DAO, call it differently, and solve all these issues. And basically, like move all the players who don't want to do it in the old system to the new system, for example. And it's all very easy, easily doable. Yeah. So, in other words, I, so I, I wanted to put I, a concept here. Sorry, you go ahead. Go ahead, Johan. Go ahead. Okay, sure. No, no, go ahead. Go ahead. I'll, I, I'll follow up. I was going to say, like, for me, the analogy, I mean, you were saying it's like. Um, Michael was saying it was kind of like a government or or kind of like a country, how you'd run it. Uh, the analogy, I guess, what I'm hearing is you could, if you're not happy with the system, if you're not happy with the new financial institution or the financial institution you're in, the people from one day to the other could have a vote and they could all say, screw this government, we go we go remake kind yep. of deal. Is that is that, is that correctly? Yeah. 
because I think, yeah, like that is, that to me is one of the main themes about the digital technology that, that, that we have. If we can make it so safe, we can make what even safer than uh, with paper currencies, because that's been a big theme for humans throughout time is to try and fake money and abuse also money. It's like, if we can rid ourselves of, of, of a corrupt system and, and make something that is less corrupt or, or infinitely less corrupt, then I think it's one of the biggest, it will be one of the biggest steps forward as, as people like this is, and this is where I, I see the biggest value in, in blockchain technology. And I think NFTs and, and the digital assets and stuff, I think it's big interest for people. I do think it's less of, a, I mean, it will have impact on some people's lives, I'm sure, but I think this other thing could impact the world. Um, or if you, if we could actually change the financial institution to, from what it was to more power to the people, more transparency, more, more rights, more voting. Um, I think most people would agree with, with those sentiments, but, but yeah, that's, that's what I see in, in as potential for, for this technology. Yeah, I think at the end of the day, it's it's infrastructure so I you set say, up. One second, Michael. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, wait. So I, I just really want to anchor this thought of what you guys are talking because I, I need people to understand one thing and you touch by it very, very briefly. In World of Warcraft, Blizzard made a game. And Blizzard sold the game to people for money. And then they said the only way you can play this game is that if you pay $14 a month to play World of Warcraft. So as a developer, they gave the game, they made everybody pay for the game. And then after they pay for the game, they sold the game for $64 million or something like that, 64 billion on the company. They kept all the money and everybody that was spending $14 a month got nothing in return. Everybody that spent thousands and thousands and thousands of hours got nothing in return. So understand the scale. We are saying that you players should be thankful that we're making a game for you. You're really not value. Your value to us is that you pay $14 a month. And when everything that I do goes well, I make all the money, not you. That is exactly the paradigm that we're discussing. Because we're going to have flip it around to what you guys are talking by saying, if you play World of Warcraft and you're spending $14 a month, you are actually an investor in this ecosystem. So whatever happens with this, if we do well, you should be rewarded because we grew this shit together. That's the key, right? So if World of Warcraft works and we sell it for billions of dollars later, you, random player that have spent 3,000 hours and have spent it maybe $200 from the last three years, should get a part of that. And I'll say it, as, long, as, long, like, as long as you opt to keep your tokens or whatever, yeah. Exactly. But yeah, people should have an option, like people should have a option to have an ownership and this ownership shouldn't come at like massive expense as well. Yeah. Like I'm pretty sure like most of the blockchain games that out that will be out there, like yeah, if you played whatever, 10,000 hours, uh, you'll probably have quite a few tokens at the end of the day. Okay. So now a DAO, which is what Ev Evgeny, I wanted to bring you in. This is why you talked to me over that lunch in Lisbon. You said, we should make a project where anybody that spends time, spends mind power, spends whatever resources they have, whatever friends they have, anybody that contributes in any way, shape or form should be part of the rewards that we can achieve together. This is exactly what Michael told me also two years ago. And he said, I'm only interested in building a project that takes me to that place of dividends of Anybody that gets to contribute, if we all do it together, we can all get things together. Not necessarily only a t-shirt or a hoodie or merch. It's more like, no, if we spend in real time, time has a real value in money. So that time that you're spending is your investment inside this project. I think it's just fascinating. I would only go to a quick argument to your point before. If you are paying for purely entertainment, I also think there's a, I mean, that is also a concept of, of things. And if, if World of Warcraft, I'm not saying that you got every, every month you were $14 worth or 10 bucks worth. Um, but if you are paying for entertainment or if you're paying for something, then it, it might, it, not, it doesn't always go as an investment. But if it's something that you're investing in or if you're, you're given a token or if you're given something, then of course, I, I would always argue that. Uh, yeah, transparency, seeing who runs away with all the assets, and then yeah, sixty-eight billion is a means that there was something that that worked really well but there. And they, 
Mm -hmm. Think about it. Like, I understand it. Because before I used to thought, okay, I just pay $14. It's my entertainment. I won. Mm -hmm. But the truth is that World of Warcraft needs other players like me. So we can make the game more fun for all the other ones. Of course. Think about good actors, people that are not toxic, people that are not doing this, people that create great PvP, people that lead raids in World of Warcraft that are literally making the game fun for everybody else. It's just sure. a fact. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, those yeah. people, like like Michael was saying, not everybody should get it, you know? Just, just, not everybody just on the street, but people that are actively making the game more fun. Go ahead, Michael. No, I just, just want to add, uh, Johan, I mean, he has a point uh, where like not everybody actually plays to own and get equity because, I mean, us four, we're probably a bit more on the, on the entrepreneurial um, mindset side of things where we, we like that stuff. Like we like to build, uh, to play and get equity and be rewarded and all this. There are a lot of players also, they don't want to think at all about money when they play. They just want to play and have fun. And that's all they want to do. And it's totally okay as well. And I think a good blockchain game has a, a space for all these different kinds of players, like players that just want to have fun and consume and have entertainment um, and players that are like small entrepreneurs they want to small, build small businesses and i think that's 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 legitimate as well like with all these scholarships in axie infinity where you like lend out your axes to other people like and people like doing that it's a whole new experience basically and also like large-scale entrepreneurs like esports teams for example i mean if esports teams are basically marketing retention machines for games um and when they compete on stage um people that watch they like playing the game afterwards so they come back to the game right and I mean, esports teams, yes, they receive money for that as well, but they don't really have equity, I think, in the, you know, in the company um, and, and they have to survive as sponsors. I so I think like if, for example, there's a blockchain game out there that distributes equity to the very best players, I think it's really good for esports teams because then they can get these good players, equip them with uh, knowledge um, and, you know, equipment and uh, coaching um and get equity in return and do maybe a split also with the uh with the players um so i think it's it's generally very very interesting um also for just everything around it also content creators in general like the short tail of the really good content creators or like the long tail of like the the, the smaller content creators as well um they should also have some equity because they build this up um but in, in other games even like games for even forbid those content creators to like put content on youtube that's it's yeah, it's not how it should be. So I think I'm also very excited to just distribute like equity to the right people that actually add value. And yeah, I was going to say, like, for example, when I was in World of Warcraft, I made the guild and I was the one running this and I was the one making maps, you know, and I was doing a, hey, we should do this. We should do this. We should do this. So in a way, people like me were making the game more fun for everybody else because we actually spend time outside of yeah. the game trying to figure out how to make it fun for everybody else. And Imagine like what Michael was saying is honestly, dude, it's just my brain is about to explode. Imagine how much has Valve and Dota grow because I know, I'm sure you have it in your mind. Put in your 10, 10 to 20 biggest influencers or players in the game. How much has the community came back to the game to watch you guys play? How much we play the game again every single time I see you guys compete? So you guys are in a way the core fabric of what makes this game exciting. So yes, you get a prize pool for competing, but shouldn't you also be rewarded for the retention that you bring to this game? I would hope so. I, of course, I would hope so. I also think it is uh, Valve's right or the people who founded the company Valve, it's their right to do whatever they want to do with their company. And, 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 mm -hmm. and if they never, if there's a project that somebody made, and wanted to see through to the end, I also think it should be that person's right. I don't think a project can ever grow unless it really starts um, in influencing lives directly, which you could always argue that this also, also is doing, uh, but that's because we then became dependent on it and we started playing the game. I, I would still say that it is well within somebody's right to start a project and see it through to the end, and that project can look like you know, I want to do everything my way. I don't want to give away anything. Like you can choose to play my game or whatever. But of course, I would like to play in an esports scene and be in a sphere where it does feel truly like a partnership and it does feel like my I am valued and that, yeah, people come back to watch us play, to watch pro players uh, go again. And, and when it's like that and we then try to work on a nice project, then I want to have cooperation and not, not somebody who just wants to see... Um, yeah, because now it's now it's more now it's more than just a game, right? For a lot of people, for me included, now it is livelihood. Now it's uh, entertainment that 
reaches a lot of people. Um, and it would be nice to see the transparency and true partnership happen. Uh, but yeah, it, Dota, Dota is one of the craziest community games. It is really crazy how much people have given in, in battle passes, in time spent, in, in content being made. Um, and what Valve gives back, or which they do give back, is a good product. It's always been, I think, what carries the game. But something that is 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 missing, uh, and something I think people feel like they could do more with, is is that transparency and 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 also feeling more value, and also feeling that their time, if it is producing a lot of entertainment, is if it is producing a lot of money, um, that you know they sunk they sink in hundreds of hours, that they also get that support back in one shape or another financially. Um, yeah, I would like to I would like to work with it that makes more. Me wonder, you know, <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe we cannot change Dota and CSGO and League, <clears throat> but is there a world where we, OG, you know, look at those new titles, find real good titles that are really doing good things, you know? And by the time we put our brand and our players and our ecosystem and our knowledge, you know? Because if we get another game, let's call it, I don't know, like Ninja Ninja Ninja, that's the new title of the new game. And by us getting a team from there and putting it through the OG ecosystem, the OG coaching staff, we know that those guys are going to be really good. So in a way, us investing our know-how on esports and our know-how on social media and content on that, on that new game will accelerate that game immensely. And if we get a bunch of people that are a bunch of teams and people that have that know-how, then shouldn't we all be owners of that game? And I'm going to put a, a stop here because this is the earn to play. But this is not the only DAOs or the only technology that we're looking at when we look at crypto. When Evgeny again and I went to lunch in Lisbon, he said, have you thought about actually not fundraising for OG at all? Have you thought about instead of just doing a normal funding where we get 10, 20 millions, we give equity for the company, have you thought about creating a DAO? And I said, okay, what, what does it mean that? He said to me, well, what you do is that you tell the people, hey, this is the OG project and we're going to open hypothetically to play Ninja Ninja Ninja. But instead of OG funding, what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a DAO and we're going to sell part of this DAO and tokens of this DAO. And whatever happens with this success or with failure, it will be for everybody else to celebrate. Hopefully, hopefully, it's so good because OG has so much know-how that our chances of success are much higher than many other people. So that's what you guys are in a way, like the, the founders of the DAO. But shouldn't make sense that everybody that invested on OG Ninja 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 if OG wins the eye in that game, should get part of that money? And then my mind exploded. So Evgeny, I'm bringing you in. Tell me a little bit more about this, because this is when I think it changed the world for me. Because I only was thinking about earn to play, and then I was like, wait a second, actually I can do this in a business perspective. Yeah, to me it kind of clicked when, when you guys, but when you told me like, okay, how, how expensive the league teams are, for example, because it just blew my mind that you need to spend tens of millions of dollars to acquire those teams is just completely insane. It's very unsustainable for, well, for a startup to do that. Like you need to do a massive fundraise and basically if you're, if you're outside of crypto, it's like close to impossible. I was like, oh, you need to dilute yourself massively. In crypto though, like raising 20 million bucks, it's very much doable. Like it's, it might be a bit kind of tough now, like this current market environment, but like half a year ago, if you guys would have created like OG, DAO effectively and said, okay, we are raising, like, we are selling some tokens to raise money for our league team, to acquire a league team, I'm pretty sure it would be, like, very doable. And basically the ideas that I had is, look, like, you have, I don't know, thousands of supporters on Discord, for example. Like, they are also people who make OG successful in a way because, like, well, big bunch of the advertising budget is effect well big, big big bunch of the budget for OG is uh, advertising and advertising directly comes from those people supporting OG right so it would make sense also to potentially reward like people who are supporting those tokens and make make them also co-owners of this like not massive owners but like gives them actually a yeah, piece of the success of the whole team and I think that's what DAOs is about it's like basically spreading this ownership as much as possible to all the contributors because like your fans are also contributing a lot. So now I'm going to put it even more in Linman terms. <clears throat> OG, instead of raising $30 million to get into League of Legends 
and then giving our company 40% of our company away to an investor, what we do is we say, okay, let's fundraise together like a crowd, like a crowdfunding, these 30 millions. And what we're going to do is anybody that <clears throat> either buys tokens or immediately will have ownership of the company. But that is not the only way to actually get ownership. If you are willing to do watch parties, if you're willing to lead community, if you're willing to contribute doing this, if you're willing to create your own content, if you're willing to do anything that we create on the on this sheet of paper, you know, if you do any of these things, you will start earning equity and tokens of this. So right now, at the starting point is 30 million valuation 30. But in two years, this 30 million investment might be worth 300. But we are going to get there together. So anybody that has been contributing through this process to OG's League of Legends success, by the time we're in 300, if we were to sell this company to South of Arabia and we sold it for 300 million, then we will go back and pay everybody that was contributing there for their work, their effort, their investment and their devotion. Not the first person that put 30, like it would happen right now. I thought that was amazing because then I can see why somebody would be like, okay, not only I am cheering for OG, but I'm cheering for OG because if they win, if they do well, if they sell the sponsors, if they do this, then it's my success as well. <clears throat> Which is the whole idea of boring apes in a way, you know? If you have something that now Michael, you and I share, now we're actually uniting resources. Now you're actually going to your side of the world and evangelizing OG because you fucking want OG to win and you want OG to be doing, doing good. And then if you are also allowed to open an OG League of Legends store, let's say that if you have more than a thousand tokens, you get to open a store, whatever you want, with a specific franchise and specific regulations. If you have more than 30,000 tokens, you can also open like your own headquarters somewhere else. So you see, now in a way you create these governance that are the rules of the land, but if you really write the rules really well, it means that everybody else gets to be entrepreneurial in their side of the world. I, this is, this is mind blowing because then not all, I don't have fans at that point. I have an army of smart people and passionate people pushing for this. This is amazing. Now for the record, League of Legends will never do, let us do this, but we're talking about a hypothetical world that they would. Yeah, and also adding to this, um, it's also a very liquid way of paying people and distributing, as you said, ownership, not just people buying and then receiving tokens and then just sitting there. Um, there's also, I mean, in an ideal DAO, there's a big uh, part of the tokens reserved for people contributing and doing stuff. So this could be from the Discord mod, for example, um, to somebody who's writing guides, to somebody who's doing, I don't know, cutting content. Um, and just comes in on a project basis and you pay that person with tokens, which means with ownership. Um, but it's also, for example, giving tokens to partners that you have. So maybe, um, let's say there's a, I don't know, a decentralized ESL at some point and they have their own tokens, right? They could do a token swap with you guys. So they swap ESL tokens for OG tokens and you're perfectly aligned to grow together. So it's kind of like, again, going back to setting the right incentive structures to give ownership to the right key people that are adding value and, and growing together. Um, and it's, it's super hard to do on a legal level. Like you can't like give somebody easily equity, uh, or like a stake, you know, in, in your company like this, uh, for work. I mean, it's doable, but it's a lot of paperwork and, um, different from country to country. And what's really nice with crypto is just like a very, like, like digitally native, um, infrastructure to pay people no matter where they are, um, and just pay them for the work. Like there's DAOs that. Uh, and, and Dylan, I mean, Dylan is working, working on that front. Like he, uh, our mutual friend, like he's actually every single month, he's saying, okay, this contributor gets that much, this contributor gets that much, and then they get paid, uh, for their work. And yeah, I think it's just a general, like the in terms of like future of work and thinking about these things about employment and all this, I think that's also very fascinating. So look, I will give you a specific thing and a specific knowledge. So Johan and Seb and I have spoken a lot about people that are contributing to OG. Okay, just free moderators. Everybody has them, free fans. And we have a plan where we're going to pay or try to pay as much if not every one of those contributors. Every one of the moderators of, uh, of the OG Discord, we're going to try to figure out a way to pay them. And I think that this is the key here, is I can't give them equity of OG. 
I wish I could, because they actually are building OG in their own many ways. They are a core fabric of our OG. So the only thing that I can give them right now is money. Money or merch, obviously the respect and love. But I do think that people have to pay rent with more than respect and love and merch. So there is this needs to be a transactional element of I need to make money out of this. So right now, I am gonna give them we're gonna give them compensation. But it still feels short. It still feels that they deserve more. So if we were able to create a system where we could reward everybody that builds OG and makes OG, I think this is a future that I like. Johan, I still don't know what that version is or how it does look like, but shit, it's a version that I would love. I mean, for me too, I think it's a very exciting prospect to, I mean, I wish I grew up in a, in a way and in a world where investments were more, um, I mean, transparent and, and like as a concept for me, investment was always exactly that you, you invest something in a company. And then if that project that you, you started with, it comes to fruition, you see that fruit as well. Like you help grow the tree. Um, and I think, yeah, with, with wall street or like the stock market or, or all that, it's, it's, it's always about, you know, trying to have your money produce more money is never, is never really that personal. Then you want to directly invest in something. Um, but with crypto, it's like it, it was like the point before with how it's very hard to legally because you don't want to have a, we don't want to have this project OG and have you know tw- twenty thousand chefs in the kitchen it's not going to work the, the thing's going to fall apart but people that are actively working and trying their hardest even with mess ups or even not having like the the, the core company structure uh, procedures in, in in play you can still invest you can still be an owner you can still get rewarded for yeah your effort. Um, that's that's something that excited me when you were also telling me like that if i were growing up i would have i would have started investing a lot sooner if it if that was a system you know and and i felt mm-hmm. like i was on board i was i was part of something um yeah i i think it is it is a very it's a very golden fix to to many things having like a currency uh, that is way more transparent way more international way easier to uh, transfer into into stuff like this, into like an investment or into a product or into, um, or, and then you can also get paid like this, you know, for your efforts very quickly, very, yeah, I, uh, I hope, I hope we can make that happen one day. I, it would excite me a lot. And when I was in Lisbon again with Evgeny, I think he was even talking about, like you're saying, okay, it might be hard to find a way to create the government, but it's not impossible. And the idea is, do we want to be able to decentralize? Because that is the thing that scares a lot of people, which is, look, I don't want to get political right now with all this, but it's very strange to me that the rhetoric of the esports and gaming community is exactly aligned with the mainstream media. It's so weird to me because we've been the rebel alliance the whole time. We've been the ones saying decentralizing is always good. No, non main banks, no things like that. No countries having this much power, not people telling us what to do. But the moment that people are trying to do that, everybody shits on them. So I want to be clear about this. And I publicly have gone about this several times. People that are bad actors should be chased out of this ecosystem. We're not discussing that. Bad actors in any kind of business should be taken away. But we have to understand that people are just hearing NFTs and hearing crypto. Oh, I make three times my money. I make five times my money. And it's coming to a speculation right now and gambling. This is not what it's supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a speculation and gambling. It's supposed to be products that intertwine with each other that build towards one direction. I have said this publicly as well, that anybody that has ever bought an OG NFT, they're in for a long run. Those NFTs will have real value at one point. When we build this ecosystem and we build this thing that we want to build, every one of those tokens will trigger new free tokens and things like that, that you can convert and burn all that. But this immediate reaction of, oh, this is new, therefore it's to be bad. But this is what I wanted all my life. I wanted banks not to have my money. Nobody to tell me what to do. Like that's how I ended up in gaming. I didn't end up in gaming because I was following the rules. We end up here because we didn't want anybody's rules. 
it was my way to escape reality and run away and just be like my own thing with my own friends and my own group. And somehow we have now a company that is like the Rebel Alliance and we get to do whatever we want. People tell us, you cannot do that. I'm like, eh, well, watch me, which is why we never got funded. So we can continue doing whatever we want. The moment that you get funding, the moment that you get a public trading effort, a, a public offering, the moment that you go public, which is the similar thing where people can just buy your shares, you're, you're screwed because you are under a million scrutinies of a system that is built for you not to survive. It's built by those people on the way on the top that want you to stay there and to stay poor. So again, it's very early. Again, maybe I'm just too syndicalist in this point. Maybe I'm too much of a dreamer, but I will continue bringing voices like you, Michael, like you, Evgeny, to talk about this because I like that future. So I want to wake up tomorrow in a world where that future is possible. Yeah. I have to, because otherwise I don't really like this one, you know? And I, and I think I think there's something there. Um, you just have to figure out properly how this looks like. Because I mean, there's, as you said, there's also a lot of risks involved, uh, financial risk as well. I mean, if if you invest your savings into a token and the token goes down, um, that obviously sucks, but that's the reality. Like you should never invest uh, money that you actually need, like only invest money that, you know, if it, if it goes down, that's the nature of things. It's just, um, yeah, it's like h high risk, high reward kind of, uh, thing. And I think a lot of, I don't know, like a lot of people don't really think that way. They prefer to just gamble with this and just put their money in that they maybe cannot afford to lose and hope it goes up five X and then it goes down. Um, and I think, so there also needs to be a lot of education, I think, around this, uh, what kind of asset class this really is and uh, what an investment actually means. And I think, for example, like if somebody doesn't really have the funds to invest their money, they can still invest their time and grind for equity this way. And I think, you know, of course, they're still welcome in the community and they can still help. Um, but I think as a, especially I think as an esports team that where you reach so many people, um, they're extremely passionate about gaming and esports. Um, it's even more important to properly educate them of what the risks are and what it all means. Um, yeah, because I think it's back back to like, for example, G2, when they announced their NFT project, there was there was a lot of backlash. And um, quite frankly, it's kind of it's a bit sad for me personally to see this because I've been working super hard the last three years or so to like bring NFT gaming closer to the masses. And it's, I think it's net positive for the people, but it's, um, it's not perceived as such because there's of course so much risk and there's a lot of scams. Right. And I think generally the average game, I think is also generally scared of new stuff because with free to play, for example, when free to play came out, the first games were very bad. Like there was like a paywall all of a sudden after level six, I don't know, for example. Um, well, I guess with like all these, uh, like DLCs as well. Um, it destroyed the game experience. So I think players are just generally worried that it destroys uh, their games. And I think that I can understand that. Um, but I think, again, we have to like, basically what we're doing now, like properly share, okay, what is this thing that is being built? Um, how should you think about it um, as a gamer? And how can also you get, like, get involved and contribute to what we're building here? Um, and I think that's also part of the big challenge. Like it's not just a technical thing or like a financial thing. It's a lot of like a mindset building of like how to approach these things, in my opinion. Evgeny, what are you, your thoughts on this matter? We're going to wrap the podcast pretty soon. Yeah, I think to, to me, it's kind of two, two big aspects. So first, yeah, what, what Michael mentioned is, is general freedom. And it's freedom, on one hand, it's freedom to invest whatever you want and do whatever you want. And it's very different from current financial markets because you cannot, like in most countries, you cannot actually just as easy as that, go and buy Apple shares. You need to register as a broker. Sometimes you need to actually prove that you're a qualified investor. You can't, like most people cannot invest in startups, for example. It's all very protected, protect, protected. Like it's so, which means that like a lot of people don't have the same access to opportunities as rich people do, uh, especially when it comes to startup investment, investment for example. Uh, but it also means that they're protected against like, well, scams and, like really bad outcomes. They're not 100% protected. They can still lose money. Uh, like, and we see like current, I don't know, stock market went down now. So anyone can lose money anyway, but yeah, it's, so crypto is about freedom primarily, but it's freedom to make money and also lose money. And the second bit is, I think it's about ownership. And to me, that's, that's a very important thing because if you, 
if you think in the real world or mid space, how we call it sometimes, um, you own a car, you own an apartment, you own, I don't know, something else like all this, all the physical stuff around you or not physical stuff around you. You don't really own it. It's basically guaranteed to you by governance, governance, uh, government where you live, like the country where you live. So wherever, if you live in Germany, German government guarantees you have this apartment. If you live in Canada, Canadian government guarantees you have the money in your bank account, pretty much. But if they don't want you to, then you won't have this anymore. Like you suddenly might not have an apartment or you might not have a car. So you need to be friendly with government. You need to play by the government rules. Um, same with Dota. Like if you don't own any of those any of those Dota skins, like Valve owns them. Like if they don't want them anymore, they will take them take them from your accounts. They can like re redraw them. They can do whatever they want with them. Uh, and basically, blockchain is very opposite of this. Blockchain replaces this ownership, which is very viable by central central uh, central something like government or company by technology by blockchain technology so you effectively you always own those nfts like nobody can take those nfts from you unless they're like unless as uh, you're scammed uh, and you don't understand how you manage like your keys and everything but in general like you you own this and nobody can take it from you and uh, nfts tokens it's it's basically verified on blockchain and blockchain guarantees this ownership instead of the central counterparty and that's that's a really really important aspect to understand i would say this is really interesting obviously i think we could spend hours and hours and hours and i think that we should get back together uh in a few months from now and have a follow-up conversation but i wanted at least people to see why we've been pushing for this and why we've been vocal about this whole thing i i want to thank you both for joining us and Johan, I would like to say uh, final thoughts for you. I think I, I already shared my rant. So those were my final thoughts. Final thoughts from you? No, I mean, my, my main thoughts is what I, what I brought up before is, is yeah, I think there is um, good for humans, good for future generations to be had where we change the system. I mean, this is like, again, a very profound podcast, I guess, when we go into the topics like that. But for me, this is like the main potential of, of crypto technology yeah like taking power away from from people who say i have authority over you and and kind of like boosting the confidence in in the young people that they also have uh and then myself being one of them like have the ability to to change things to change uh, authority to change the system um to not have people like make bad calls on your behalf, uh, or, or to at least be part of every bad call that's going to be made. Um, yeah. And then NFTs, I think have had a, have just been a bad, like, I, I think that the best thing that could happen if, if NFTs got a different name and it just became something, something else, because now I think it's very, uh, everybody thinks of NFTs as a simple digital, um, artwork, but what it's more than that, it's like the, it's an asset. Um, and this artwork thing about copy paste and that is not worth something. Well, again, I own so many things in Dota that are kind of not really worth anything materially, but in Dota, it's a cool skin. It's cool cosmetic. It's something that I care about. It's, and people do these things with their steam profiles. They, 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 they make them unique. And this uniqueness is something that people crave for. You have a auction house being made in World of Warcraft. Steam has their own auction and it has many layers where you can, it's not just money it's also also with cards, humans always going to go towards this type of, 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 of trade of this type of structure in games. And when the game is good, for sure, this will happen. And if we were to introduce like a blockchain, blockchain technology or NFTs, I just think it would be more part with the people. It would be safer. You would not be, you'd be scammed less. You would, um, yeah, it's simply just a technology. Right. And, and I just think it has a really bad rep, but, but yeah, I'm all for all for the, the the possibility that technology can give us, and I think this is one of them. Uh, like, it can advance our our civilization, can advance us as people, give give people more ability. So, um, yeah, that's my two cents. Uh. Well, I think this podcast was a little bit different than the other ones that we've done. Way more serious and intellectual. I hope you all have enjoyed it. I, I've been told by the social media team to say, please like and subscribe. I feel very cheap saying this. Maybe I should, we should dial this whole podcast. 
But yeah, uh, thank you so much again for tuning in and I'll, we'll see you guys next week. Thank you so much, guys, for joining. Thank Cheers. you, guys. Thank you. It was awesome. Thank you.